Okay, good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am your host, Krista Burns, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly online event. Uh, yes, we're a webinar. You can call us that. We won't be offended. Um, that we ha hold every Wednesday mornings at 10 a.m. Central Time. Um, we cover anything that would be of interest to librarians um, on the show, and we have presentations, interviews, mini training sessions sometimes, just anything we can come up with or that we find that's interesting out there to share with librarians. Um, as I said, we do these shows, do the show live every Wednesday morning, but you, if you are unable to join us on Wednesdays, that's fine. We do record all of our sessions. So if you um, want to watch, weren't able to join us on Wednesdays, just go to our website and you'll be able to um, watch any of the recordings of our previous shows. Uh, we have Nebraska Library Commission staff that come on and do presentations sometimes, and we have guest speakers that come on. And today we have a, a little mixture of it. <laughs> um, today we are um, going to be hearing about ebooks. Um, and in South Dakota, actually, the changing landscape in South Dakota schools with the ebooks that they are using there. And on the line with us, we have Julie Erickson and Joan Appel from uh, the South Dakota State Library. Can you guys say hi? Good morning. Hi. Good morning. Thank you for having us. Great. And with me here in Nebraska is um, Susan Nisley, who is our online services librarian, and she's in charge of our OverDrive group. And she'll be talking just briefly about that a little later. You can say hi. Hi, everybody. <laughs> um, but what we're going to um, go to right away is um, Julie and Joan are going to go ahead and um, give us a presentation about what's going on with uh, eBooks in South Dakota. So go ahead, guys, and take it away. Awesome. Good morning, everybody. We are really excited to talk today about eBooks, the changing landscape in South Dakota schools. We're going to be looking at trends we've seen in South Dakota. However, we feel like these will translate into other areas as well. And just for background, the majority of our schools are serving less than 1,000 students. So if that helps, helps your perspective in terms of what we're, we're working with. And I'm Joan Yupel. I'm one of the school library coordinators for the South Dakota State Library. And in the, that um, role, I do site visits. So I've visited almost every school library in our state by now. <laughs> and how many is that, Joan? <laughs> oh, about 400. Awesome. And I'm Julie Erickson. I'm an electronic resources coordinator for the South Dakota State Library. And I manage the state's online subscription resources in addition to working um, to coordinate the, the public library downloadable um, ebooks and audiobooks through OverDrive. I have a colleague, Jane Healy, who does this with me. And today, we're going to map the route here through ebooks. We know we've been talking about ebooks for years, but it seems lately we've been getting many, many more questions from the basic to the complicated. And again, we're not endorsing one product over another. We, we do have examples and things that we're seeing out in the field. But we're going to start with some myth busting and then show you a few statistics, talk a little history, and then go over a few models and some options. Well, to start with our ebook myth busting, not every book is available in ebook form. Now, that seems obvious, but we get many, many questions. We recently had a teacher who was just desperate. She needed an ebook copy of a certain picture book, and she needed it tomorrow. Well, it just isn't available. And again, ebook availability is due to publisher choice. The other thing we see quite often, and, and I've seen for, for years, is people, you can, you can see that a library owns an ebook, and they want to know, well, I could interlibrary loan the paper book. Could I interlibrary loan the ebook? Unfortunately, no. You cannot interlibrary loan ebooks in most cases. And so even though you see that a library has it, and it is a, you know, online resource, you can't get access to it. So interlibrary loaning an ebook isn't something that you, you can easily do or is usually available. The other thing we see quite often is we'll have um, librarians get really excited because they got e-readers. 
um, e-readers is unfortunately just one of the steps to having e-books available to your students. And so just because you have e-readers doesn't mean you have e-books. And that can be really disappointing because um, you know, you, you typically we've seen that the schools have had to go through a lot of hoops and and review to get the e-readers and then, you know, wait, we don't really have anything to put on the e-readers. And we'll look at some free resources, but as with, you know, anything free, there are, you know, drawbacks to the free resources and um, some of the other options. And so you may want to consider, you know, and and, and e-readers and e-books are really two separate webinars. Um, that could be a whole other day, right, Joan? <laughs> exactly. And then we hear a lot, well, you don't need a library or even a librarian anymore because everything's on the Internet and we can get it for free. Well, unfortunately, not everything is free. Many things are still behind paywalls. And like Julie mentioned, not everything free is what you want, nor is it of the quality that you want. So. One of those things is it takes time to sort through those three things. We say it's a little bit like getting a free puppy. The puppy's free, but the shots, the food, everything else are still a cost. And then that leads us right into our last myth that, well, every ebook works, works on every device. There still seems to be continuing confusion about the different formats of ebooks. And, you know, my daughter gave me a nook for Christmas. Now I want ebooks. So again, it's that lack of some basic information and understanding, and we're all going to get there sooner or later. So our next step is we're going to take a quick look at where we are in South Dakota. In South Dakota, we have 25% of our schools that currently offer ebooks, and 25% of the schools offer Bring Your Own Device, or BYOD. What's cool about that is Allowing the, the you know, BYOD means that the schools can focus on e offering ebooks and not necessarily worrying about having to provide all the devices for all the students. In South Dakota, because the State Library provides subscription access to um, electronic resources, 100% of our schools have access to the State Library's subscription electronic resources. Later on in the webinar, we'll look at some of the resources we provide that are have ebooks and are able to be transferred to portable reading devices. And finally, the other thing that we really wanted to emphasize is your public library can be a resource for you in the school community. In South Dakota, 77% of students, or 77% of South Dakota citizens have access to ebooks through their public libraries. So how does that compare nationally? Nationally, 25% of our schools have ebooks. 33% offer BYOD, so South Dakota compares really well nationally. 82% of schools nationally have access to subscription electronic resources. South Dakota blows that out of the water. And 67% of citizens have access to ebooks through their public libraries. So looking at your public library as a source for ebooks is a, a good place to look. Some of the other things we found while we were preparing for this webinar were, was a shift. There is the uh, recent, just as we were working on this um, earlier this spring, the Pew Internet um, released the um, teenagers' smartphones and how they're already changing the world. 37% of U.S. teens have a smartphone. And what a lot of people don't realize is you can read ebooks on smartphones. Many smartphones have that capability. And it really isn't that small of a screen once you, in fact, I don't have a device. I read on my smartphone. The other thing that we've found, and this is more anecdotal, is income is not a determinant for students having a smartphone. And so many times you're going to see there are more smartphones than, you know, maybe even, you know, computers in the home, for example. The other thing that, that popped up while we were doing our research, and it's been in the media more as there's been discussion about, you know, the Nook and how their sales have, have declined. 
ebook reader preference is declining. And we found a study out of Digital Book World and how there's a shift from e-readers, dedicated pe people who use dedicated e-readers, to using tablets with the apps for their um, programs downloaded on them. You know, Kindle has, a, has an app. Nook has an app. I have both of those on my smartphone, and trust me, they let you buy books that way, too. Um, Ebook readers have, who prefer a tablet have increased in just a few months, and the ebook readers who prefer a dedicated reader have decreased in that same time period. And so that is definitely something to think about as you are looking at, you know, thinking about devices and thinking about, you know, how you're going to have students read ebooks. Um, and then Joan has another um, comment here about how they e-read. Right. There's a recent study out of Scholastic who, of course, looked at the K-12 student. And kids have been reading e-books for a long time through, of course, desktop computers. But the switch now is they prefer to read on anything except a desktop computer. So um, smartphones, ha any handheld device, any tablet is really increasing, especially in the under 30 age, of course. And ebooks have been around for a lot longer than we think. In fact, one of the things we like to ask is, you know, when do you think ebooks started? And if you look at this awesome slide that Nebraska's Michael Sowers put together, thanks, Michael, um, you'll see that Project Gutenberg originated back in 1971. The other thing we like to talk about is, you know, when do you think the iPad was released? And when we do this before we release the slide and, and have interaction, we typically get, oh, that was five, six, was it ten years ago? Uh, no, it was in 2010. And so if you think about that, um, feels like the iPad has been around forever, but it hasn't. It's only been around for a few years. So. You know, the technology has been around for a long time. It's changing really quickly. But, you know, you're really not that far behind if, you know, you don't have an iPad. Well, or, you know, you haven't even thought about a tablet. It's only been a couple of years. You can still get, you know, in, into um, the program. <laughs> and the fact that, you know, e-books have been around since the 70s is, is actually really quite cool. And to help wrap our mind around what's available and who needs it out there, we really feel like we have, we can narrow it down to three audience models. You have the consumers, which primarily are the adults, but that also includes fam kids and their families. Then you have the public library um, audience, and then of course you have the school, school library audience as your third group there. Now, when you look at the consumer model or the consumer audience, of course, right away, everyone thinks of Amazon and Barnes and Noble. That is what's through the media. That's what the general public know about. They equate ebooks with Kindles and Nooks. And rightfully so. They've gotten the word out, and that has the use of ebooks through those two have increased greatly because not only did they offer you the device, but the content at the same time. And of course, as Julie mentioned, there are apps for all of these. You can read them. I started out reading ebooks first on my Blackberry, for instance, then moved on to other devices. But one, and of course, then the iPod, and or excuse me, the iPad and the, and the iPhone. But besides Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and Apple, we do have the library model for the consumer, which seems to be a little harder to get that news out there. For example, I have a 24-year-old niece who um, used her library all the time for print, never thought that it would be available electronically. The public library is a great place to see what your options are. In South Dakota, most of our libraries have um, Overdrive. However, some of the libraries are adding other ebook resources. One has recently added Access 360. 
as a school, um, you know, encourage your students to look to the public library because most students are able to get a public library in their community. And if they're not, if they don't qualify to get a public library or public library card in their community, they may be able to purchase one. Joan purchasing, purchases a card to one of the local libraries for $35 a year, has access to their entire print and e-collection. Another way that the public library and the schools are working together in South Dakota is the public library may build special collections to support the schools. In one of our communities, the public the high school has iPads. And so every student has an iPad. The public library purchases additional young adult content so the students have recreational reading materials to use on the school provided devices. So they're developing a targeted collection and they are working with the school to you know, help promote that. And when we look to the school, we have found several years ago we had a few districts that um, received a grant and so they invested in some Sony readers, some did Nook, some did Kindles at that time. And one of the things that they found with these maybe small classroom collections of devices is they just weren't finding enough or being able to purchase enough fast enough of content for their purposes. So what we have seen the move to, rather than buy the device and provide the content that way, the majority of our schools are doing what we call, I guess in the old days, we would call they're using jobbers. Follett Shelf is one of our big ones. The majority of our schools also have Follett Destiny, and this is a great choice because, of course, it integrates right in. And they're able to provide that collection that supports the school curriculum. We also have a district that says they prefer Follett Shelf because of the many other options for note-taking and research. And now Follett Shelf, as well as the um, several other jobbers are including additional components. But the other big, what we call the jobber platform, is the OverDrive. We have schools who have subscribed to OverDrive as a district, and they feel that that's meeting their recreational fiction reading needs, especially for their older students, and also for their older students it's meeting some of the nonfiction needs. But rather than to provide the device, if they are providing the content through these two, they're getting access to many more publishers. For instance, we have a school district that's just one building, one library, K-12, less than 400 students, and they just couldn't see how they could provide an overdrive subscription by themselves. So they talked to their local public library, and together they added their um, funding together, and they were able to with their shared resources, the public library subscribed to OverDrive, and the school said, all we ask in return for our funds is that we make sure every one of our students has a public library card. And of course, you get into some of those technical things that we know you have to think about, whether um, your local tech person is, well, they certainly need to be on the same page with you, but whether they're right with you and on being able to download, and we know there are certain restrictions on school networks. But all of that, of course, is another webinar, too. These are just some choices. So now we get to the phrase that strikes fear in our hearts. We need to do ebooks. There isn't one answer to doing ebooks. And as we went through and prepared for this webinar, we really tried to think about ways to describe the content and ways to describe it and you know, how to think about it. We came up with, with a visual to hopefully make it a little more clear. There are three basic models for platform and content and what you actually pay for. The first one is you have the platform is free, but the books, you have to pay for the books. The next one is you pay a fee for the platform and you have to pay for the content. And OverDrive is a good example of that. You pay a you pay a access fee to you know have access to their platform, plus you have to buy the content book by book. And then finally, there are some models that allow you to have um, you, you pay one set fee for the platform and you get all the content included. 
other things that come along with, with the different models are you may end up with some you know, resources that have interactivity or games and quizzes. So those are all things to, to look at. Like we've said, um, in South Dakota, Overdrive is very popular. The schools are using it for their recreational fiction needs. And with Overdrive, you have to pay for the platform plus build your collection. Most of the Overdrive is a one book per person model. And so you, you can only, you know, if you want to have a class read, you know, one book, you're going to have to buy enough copies for the class. Um, they do have an annual subscription called the Simultaneous Use Plan, which is, you know, from selected publishers and suppliers. And so not every book would be available, and there's other restrictions around that. The other cool thing about OverDrive that we didn't see in a lot of the other platforms is they do have a district option. And so while some of the, some of the models require that you know, every school, if they want to have the book, they have to purchase a copy of that book. Um, with OverDrive, you have a district option, and so you could set up the elementary collection, the middle school collection, and the high school collection, and all of your elementary schools would have access to the, to the same titles. So we've been pushing you to look at your public libraries. Um, in South Dakota, we've, um, our graphics designer has created an excellent map to illustrate where um, which libraries have ebook access. And the glowing stars are the libraries that have downloadable ebooks and audiobooks in South Dakota. And um, Krista, you've invited Susan, who coordinates uh, Overdrive in your um, in Nebraska. Um, we'd just like to kind of know what, what kind of coverage you have in Nebraska and, and how that works. Sure. Yeah. Hi. Um, well, for us, our pub, our um, as far as public libraries go, um, we have Omaha Public Library, and they have their own collection. They went um, before the group got started, and so they've got their own standalone collection. Um, Lincoln City Libraries also has its own standalone collection, and those were probably the only two libraries in the state that could afford their own standalone collection, given the setup costs initially. Um, so we do have, um, then, a group. Um, it's about, I think we're up to about 140 public libraries now. Um, and actually, I think there's one school in there that got grandfathered in back with our very um, first uh, um, group that got set up. Um, so uh, we got, um, when we look at the population coverage in the state between the group collection, Omaha and Lincoln, um, we've got about 1.38 um, million uh, patrons covered out of the state population of 1.7 million. So we're getting there. Yay! <laughs> Well, it is. It's huge. Um, when, you, when you think about how many citizens have access, it is really cool. And I know you guys have done some really great things down there. I know we're always having new libraries join the group as well. It's an ongoing, growing group, growing process. Right, and um, many of the library, many of the public libraries that haven't joined yet are the libraries that serve under a thousand pop served, and you know, though based on what you get, it's not a huge cost. Um, the you know, we've got an initial um, for the really small libraries, it costs thousand dollars the first year to get to join the group and then five hundred dollars in subsequent years and for some of them that's still too much so it's still kind of a challenge it it is our lowest tier is, for the public libraries is six hundred dollars and it's we 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 have libraries that, that struggle to, to reach that however we're up to 70 libraries in South Dakota and you know we still get interest in libraries that inquire so it is but what's great about having you know access to the public library is you know and, you know you can encourage students to get a library card at their public library and then they'll have access to downloadable ebooks and audiobooks even if the school can't afford to have access thanks susan sure 
The other thing that we mentioned early on is many of the subscription resources that the South Dakota State Library provides to all schools, public libraries, and academic institutions in South Dakota have ebooks. And so the, the four big ones that have ebooks that you can download and transfer are Learning Express, World Book, ebooks on EBSCO, and Gale Virtual Reference Library. And so while these aren't the you know, popular best-selling fiction books, they are great for research and you, there's a lot of the classics in World Book Advanced. And then <clears throat> for schools, again, we talk about the job or flat platforms. And the advantage here, again, is you're having access to multiple publishers. Of course, only publishers who offer e-content would be included. It's not everything that you necessarily need or want. And of course, we're not saying that the print collections are going away. These are working hand in hand. One of the questions I get is, well, if I buy it in an e-book, why would I spend the money to buy it in a print book? Well, of course, that's a local decision, but you have available multiple formats for multiple reasons would be my answer, and that meets the multiple needs of all your students and your teachers. With um, this, the, both the Follett Shelf and the Macandia also, there are options. There are one-to-one -one titles that are available, but there are titles that are available according to publisher rights that can be used by an unlimited number of users. And one of the um, things that we have found locally, we have a district who has Follett Shelf and they held an open house one evening for parents and allowed parents to bring their own devices and set it up so that they could then access these ebooks from home through their own devices. In addition to multiple publishers, then you have just the publisher platform. Capstone seems to be a very popular one, but the downside here is that you select the titles just from Capstone or you get a, a already pre-selected set of titles. So that's a little di different on your collection development. But Capstone is very popular with teachers because, of course, everything projects on your smart board. It's always available. If I'm a second grade teacher and I want to use that frog book on Tuesday, it's there. I simply have to log in. I don't have to download or check it out ahead of time. And then Storia, which is from Scholastics, is another publisher platform. Originally, Storia was marketed as a at-home um, ebook option. The platform is free and then you purchase the content. And then it was also really set up for classroom use because there are a lot of bells and whistles in Storia where you can track students reading and things like that. I have found um, locally we had a special needs student who had a school provided iPad that they wanted him to take home and use but they didn't have any content for him. So they were, uh, they were able to use Storia and subscribe specific to specific content for that student, which helped him very much. But Storia, they tell us, is going to further develop, and they're really looking more at a library-type model to be included there. So that's one to keep your eye on, too. Another model is streaming. Tumble books have been around for a long time. Kids have used those for years on desktop computers. Tumblebook has lots of options now, and it's no longer just for the picture book crowd. It goes all the way K-12. And also they have introduced an offline option so that many schools who um, have a bandwidth problem won't have to worry about that because there is something that they can use offline. Starwalk Kids Media came about recently to meet a need for quality nonfiction as part of, of their purpose. And Seymour Simon and many of the other nonfiction authors that are very well known are part of this. And again, both of these streaming is at the time you want it, you need the bandwidth, but always available, always ready. Now Tumblebooks, it seems, has associated with Follett, and Starwalk Media has associated with Mac and Via. So again, some of these multiple publisher platforms are offering not only ebooks, but things that we would call databases. So a lot of it is looking at what are you getting for what you're subscribing to, I guess is the point there. Now pay-per-use is another interesting way to look at it. Brainhive is 
one platform that was developed specifically for K-12 for school librarians and they totally integrate the Renaissance Learning Accelerated Reader if you're doing that. Quizzes everything, totally integrates with BrainHive. BrainHive is a one dollar per checkout use for the ebooks. Mm -hmm. However, you set it up sort of um, like a debit card. You could say you have five hundred dollars and then you spend it down. I know of one school who has BrainHive, but they don't make it openly available to the entire school. The library uses it as sort of a backup when other ebooks are out and or when a teacher comes in and they need ten copies of something and they only can find eight, BrainHive can come to the rescue there for a dollar. There are lots of options too for BrainHive, um, such as you check it out so many times, then you have a what they call purchase. And again, in the ebook world, the difference between owning and leasing and purchasing, it's, it's kind of fuzzy. Um, but that, that's another thing to take a look at there with BrainHive. Another option that we are always surprised to find that people are unaware of are the differentiated options that are basically provided for free through federal services. The National Library Service Talking Books service is gone totally digital. They now have an online downloadable called BARD so that if students download books they can own them forever. This is often associated with the senior citizen talking, uh, talking book service. But it's for all ages and of course there are certain criteria that you have to qualify to be able to become a part of this but it's all for free and in South Dakota you would contact through the state library. In other states, the Braille and Talking Book Service is arranged a bit differently, but it's available for everyone. The other federal option is Bookshare, which comes to us through the U.S. Department of Education. And Bookshare is also online, and it also it has a bit different criteria than the National Library Service, but it's all differentiated options that are available for students of all ages. And as we promised earlier, there are free things out there. You do have a link to, to more free things on the handout that, that will be posted. But for the time being, um, we'll focus on a couple of them here. As with the free puppy we, Joan mentioned earlier, you know, free, free, is, free isn't always free. There are, um, the Storyline Online is, is a really great one. It's produced by the Screen Actors Guild Foundation, and they do a nice job of, of presenting um, e-books, but that's more of a, you know, you watch it on the computer type thing. We give books. Some schools use that, and Joan, didn't you have experience with that? My granddaughters, um, when, she, when she was in first grade, they used this as a read-at-home promotion so that all you needed was a desktop computer and you could be part of that program. And then some of the other resources, example we gave here is Adobe Digital Editions, they have a sample ebook library. And so you can get, in some cases, you can get um, the entire book, but in other cases you only get like chapter one or a, um, or a short synopsis of it. The content and quality is going to vary. You may not have the edition that you need. It may not be the complete complete edition. And so those are all things to consider when you're looking for, for the content there. And we have just touched the surface. And again, we're not endorsing one product over the other. We've just tried to talk about the trends with the products and examples that we, have, um, that we know of. But since we started this research, the Library Technology Reports has come out with a great document, the eBook Platforms for Libraries. And in here, there are 51 different platforms discussed in detail, and there's contact information, as well as the information has been put into chart format, which I found very helpful. As you take a look across what do they offer, what age is it for, and how do you subscribe? So I would recommend taking a look at that further. And if you have questions, we're ready for those. OK, great. Thank you, uh, Julie and Joan. Um, does anybody have any questions, comments, anything from the audience? Um, you can use the uh, question section 
of your GoToWebinar interface to type in any questions you have or any comments or any ideas about what you're doing in your school or library. Do you have anything, Susan? You want to? <laughs> Hi, this is Susan, and I actually have a question for you guys. Um, I'm just really curious about um, what's your sense of how many of your school libraries have been able to get get their own overdrive um, collection going. Um, we we've obviously had lots of interest in Nebraska, but at some point overdrive changed their policy and they won't let schools join our public library group um, they weren't interested in us um, forming a school library consortium and my uh, you know it sounded like the lowest price that they would offer to schools at the district level would be that four thousand dollars a year and so many of our schools the district is just, you know, the high school, middle school, and elementary school, and they can't afford that. So as far as I know, I just know about one, one uh, high school in the state that's actually doing a pilot with overdrive. And I just wondered how your schools are doing it, if, if any of them have been able to go it alone with overdrive. Actually, we we too had investigated trying to do a, a you know a group or, or something to help help the schools become become overdrive members, and that that isn't really an option. Um, we do have about you know between about a half a dozen schools, and I, I haven't looked lately, but we, we have about a half a dozen schools, and there are larger schools that have actually created overdrive collections, and um, are are actively actively um, using overdrive and they they did do you know they kind of went with the district model and so they've like they set up the the elementary the middle school the high school um, collections there and we we too have had interest from some of our smaller schools that want to get into into ebooks and don't and that's that's kind of where this webinar originated from or this training originated from was we we field a lot of questions from the schools and they just they want ebooks, but they don't really understand that. Like with OverDrive, it's it's a platform fee plus you have to buy the content. You you know that there are lots of options out there, but you need to look at what what the best option for your school may be. And and maybe it is look you know partnering with your public library, or encouraging your students to use the public library for their ebooks and you know doing some different things. So that's kind of that's kind of where we're at. We have similar experience. I know you guys I remember when we first started looking that you still had schools being able to join right. your, your group and I, you know and that that wasn't an option when we were looking <laughs> so I know I, it's it, it, the ebook world it changes what minute by minute <laughs> right and when we first started um, we were just doing audiobooks and schools were interested but there weren't a lot of audiobooks that would work with Macs at the time and so that stopped a lot of them from joining when we were doing audio books and so of course you know then when we started getting ebooks they were interested again but by that time overdrive changed their uh, criteria for consortium membership exactly and one of the things that we're finding too is you know the the, the districts that we had that experimented with the e-readers really are moving away from that and we have many one-to-one -one schools where the students are issued a school laptop or for instance one of our bigger districts next year every student's going to have a Chromebook mm -hmm. and so they're interested in what works with those devices but then our smaller districts who aren't one-to-one -one are really looking at that bring your own device let's offer the content and see what the kids bring it's amazing how many kids show up with smartphones and they simply need the information um, and you know a little bit of instruction and they uh, can read ebooks on their smartphones so everything we've said today and um, we'll tell you will probably change tomorrow <laughs> and that's okay one of the things we encourage our librarians is just jump into something if you're really interested in this even if it's just looking at the free things that we know are going to it's going to take a lot more of your time and a lot more instruction but it's out there and some of it is just giving it a try. We've also found that those who who are the consumer of ebooks and have tried it personally are 
much more willing to jump in and give it a try. We have, um, you know, many who say, I, I have a Kindle at home and I do this at home, but what can I do at school? And so that kind of helps make the transition. But there's no one easy answer. The other thing is we have schools, I guess, who might offer three or four platforms. If you look at their home, their library website, there's three or four, maybe five or six different platforms to get to the content you need. And that's what some of them find frustrating, that you have to say, well, no, that book is through Capstone. No, this book is you'll find in Follett Shelf, and that they have so many portals to enter. But they make it work. You work with what you got, I guess. <laughs> Okay, anybody out in the audience have any questions or comments? Nothing has come through yet. All right, doesn't look uh, like there's anything urgent. Oh, yes, go ahead. Oh, no, it's just me. I was just going to say thanks. <laughs> <laughs> We're glad everybody was able to come today, and we really appreciate mm -hmm. the opportunity to be able to, to share, share mm -hmm. this information. Okay, actually, we do have one question that just popped in there, probably typing while I was uh, talking. Uh, question is, do any of them, I assume they mean the schools there, put MARC records into their ILS for, to, um, to access the items? Yes, that is another big question we get often. And of course, depending on the platform and the publisher, it's easier sometimes than not. And that's another reason I think they've leaned toward the Follett shelf, because Follett makes it very easy to do that, as well as in Follett, with the current Common Core emphasis on text complexity, you're getting um, Lexile levels, you're getting the accelerated reader level information in your MARC record, and they're finding that's all very useful, too. Mm -hmm. And again, Mac and Via does all that, too. It's not just one or the other. It just seems that we've, in South Dakota, we're leaning to follow it. Mm -hmm. And that does, here in Nebraska, we have the, the and that does that, too. I, I have heard of, um, I do know some of our schools who have followed it have gone that route as a way to get started. So that, that's, I would say that's true in Nebraska also. But I just like and to again, add, I, I'm really glad that you ha, uh, did this session because obviously we get questions about what's going on in schools and we always feel like we don't adequately answer those questions. So I jumped at the chance to attend your webinar. So thanks for holding it. Well, thank you. And the MARC record is, an, again, is a very important thing, especially when you're, you are running maybe three or four or five different platforms mm -hmm. to find your content. Right. At least you can give them one place to start and then just send them off to the different places to get what they need. Exactly. The yeah. Well, it doesn't look like anything urgent has come in um, while we were talking. That's fine. Um, if anyone does have any questions or you think of anything, um, there is Julian Jones' contact information on there. I'm sure they'd be happy to answer any questions you have. Um, so thank you very much, Joan and Julie and Susan, for being here with us today uh, to talk about ebooks in schools and a little bit in public libraries, too. <laughs> Um, the session has been recorded. We have the PowerPoint presentation and the handout that was sent out to everyone um, will be uh, posted up along with the recording. And all of the links and things that were mentioned during the session have also been captured into our Delicious account. So you can go there to get, um, <coughs> excuse me, to get access to everything that was mentioned. So well, thank, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm going to pull back control now from you, Julie. Oh, and we've got, oh, just, I don't know if you, you guys didn't know, Jane Healy is actually on the line, and she says, great, good job, thanks. <laughs> thanks, Jane. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Jane. Okay, just waiting for my screen. There we go. All right, so thank you guys, everyone, very much for attending um, Encompass Live this week. Uh, I hope it was help for you, helpful for you. Um, as I said, it was recorded, and the recording should be up sometime later today. So you can um, watch it again or share with your colleagues who may have been unable to join us this morning. 
Um, but I hope you'll join us next week when our topic is technology in libraries, what's next? Um, Michael Sowers, who's the technology innovation librarian here at the Nebraska Library Commission, will be doing this presentation about upcoming technologies um, available to coming up for libraries. Um, this isn't his usual monthly tech talk. That was actually last week. This is just a separate sex special presentation that he is doing for us. So uh, sign up for that and join us next week. Uh, also, there we go. Uh, and Compass Live, we are on Facebook, so if you are a Facebook user, we definitely encourage you to like us on Facebook, so you can see, um, you'll get notifications of um, when new shows are coming up, new topics, when the recordings are available. Um, reminders, as you've seen here, I did a little reminder this morning, letting people know they could join us uh, for this morning's show. So uh, like us on Facebook if you are a big Facebook user. Other than that, we are uh, done for this morning. Thank you very much, everyone, for attending, and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.